Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and we are back with more news and politics. For the day, today's news is for Thursday, December 14th, 2023. Uh, anyway. Let's get into this. We'll start off with a story from the lever. How Big Oil Buys the News. David Sirota speaks with climate journalist Amy Westerbelt about how the fossil fuel industry launders their image through the use of sponsored advertorials. This week's episode of Lever Time. David Sirota is joined by award-winning climate journalist Amy Westervelt to discuss her recent bombshell report in how news outlets are ranking in millions from the fossil fuel industry to produce greenwashed sponsored content. A transcript of the episode available at the link. Amy's report reveals how outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Reuters, and Politico work directly with oil and gas industry to produce branded advertorials which straddle the line between advertisements and editorial content. While this financial arrangement raises questions about journalistic biases and conflicts of interest, what's more troubling is that the majority of readers can't tell the difference between sponsored content and genuine reporting. In today's interview, David speaks with Amy about the history of branded partnerships between fossil fuel interest and the media industry, how climate change journalists feel about this type of sponsored content and how advertorials promoting carbon capture and clean hydrogen technology provide a smokescreen for expanding oil production. The two also discussed the annual UN Climate Summit, the latest being COP28, which has been slowly infiltrated and co-opted by the oil and gas industry in order to hamper any meaningful organization against climate change. Yeah. But there's the preview of what the story is about. If you want to, you can get in, listen to it. But yeah, the look of that. I'm not surprised. Big ol's like any other big money company. Spend those billions, baby, to keep the money flowing in. And it does so because it knows these news outlets are just willing to take the money regardless. It don't give a shit about facts. It never has. And probably never will. From ProPublica, how police have undermined the promise of body cameras. Hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars have been spent on what is sold as a revolution in transparency and accountability. Instead, police departments routinely refuse to release footage even when officers kill. That's when they should be released the most often, is when an officer kills somebody. But, like, nah, the police unions, nah. If there's one union I do not like its police unions. Fuck that shit. 
When Barbara and Velvet Richards learned that the police had killed their son, they couldn't understand it. How on that day in September of 2017 did their youngest child come to be shot in his own apartment by officers from the New York Police Department? Manuel Richards, who, mo who was 31, grew up in Jamaica and had moved to New York about a year earlier after coming to the United States through a work-study program. His father's friend gave him a job doing office work, and he rented a room in the Bronx. But he started to struggle, becoming reclusive and skipping days of work. His mother, with whom he was particularly close, pleaded with him to return to Jamaica. It's as if I sensed something was going to happen, she says. I was calling him, calling him, calling him. Miguel, come home, come home. His parents knew he had never been violent, had never been arrested, and had never been had any issues with the police. What details they managed to gather came from the Bronx District Attorney. Richard's landlord, who didn't see, who hadn't seen him for weeks, asked the police to check on him. The officers who responded found Richard's standing still in his own bedroom, holding a small folding knife. After fifty and fifteen minutes later, they shot him. Richard's death. Is, marked a historic turning point. It was the first time a killing by officers was recorded by a body camera in New York. The new program was announced just months before as heralding a new era of accountability. Now, a week after the shooting, the department posted on its website a compilation of footage from four of the responding officers. The video, the department said in an introduction to the presentation, was produced for clear viewing of the event as a totality. And as far as the department was concerned, the narrative was clear. Sometimes the use of deadly force is unavoidable. The police commissioner at the time, James O'Neill, wrote in an internal message. The level of restraint shown by all officers, he said, is nothing short of exceptional. And he added, releasing footage from critical incidents like this will help firmly establish your restraint in the use of force. Richard's parents were not convinced. Velvet watched footage of the district at the district attorney's office. What he saw and what was released did not, in fact, show that the use of deadly force was unavoidable. He later learned that the department had not released all the footage. What else didn't they know about their son's death? When body-worn cameras were introduced a decade ago, they seemed to hold a promise of a revolution. Once police officers knew they were being filmed, surely they would think twice about engaging in misconduct. And if they crossed the line, they would be held accountable. The public no longer having to rely on official accounts would know about wrongdoing. Police and civilian oversight agencies would be able to use footage to punish officers and improve training. In an outlay that would ultimately cost hundreds of millions of dollars, the technology represented the largest new investment in policing in a generation. Yet, 
without deeper changes. It was a fix bound to fall far short of those hopes. In every city, the police ostensibly report to mayors and other elected officials. But in practice, they have been given wide latitude to run their departments as they wish and to police and protect themselves. And so as policymakers rush to equip the police with cameras, they often failed to grapple um, with a fundamental question. Who would control the footage? Instead, they defaulted to leaving police departments, including New York's, with the power to decide what is recorded, who can see it, and when. In turn, departments across the country have routinely delayed releasing footage, released only partial or redacted video, or refused to release it at all. They have frequently failed to discipline or fire officers when body cameras document abuse and have kept footage from the agencies charged with investigating police misconduct. Even when the departments have stated policies of transparency, they don't always follow them. Three years ago, after George Floyd's killing by Minneapolis police officers and amid a wave of protest against police violence, the New York Police Department said it would publish footage of so-called critical incidents within 30 days. There have been 380 such incidents since then. The department has released footage within a month just twice. So yeah, police bullshit just continues on unfucking abated. <sighs> yeah, fuck the fucking police, man. All right, we have from Ask History here, the original post. Why do people think Satan is a fallen angel? You see this kind of stuff in mainstream media, but where does this tradition come from? And also the tradition that Satan is Lucifer. Most modern day Christians seem to think that Satan equals Lucifer equals fallen angel, but the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament and text from that period in Odor almost always refer to Satan as a serpent slash dragon, not a fallen angel. And I don't even always refer or and I don't even know how Lucifer comes into the mix. On top of that, Satan is often depicted as a satyr which I think comes from the Middle Ages. How did that happen? And first post. There's a comprehensive answer on the evolution of views of Satan along these lines here by Doug McCrae, and they provide a link. Uh, on Lucifer as a name for Satan by Amayo 20 and another link. So we've opened up those links. Where did the idea of Satan being God's highest angel come from? They provide information, table of contents, introduction, antecedents, Theologians and sources. Antecedents to the idea of Satan as God's highest angel hereafter um, SGHA can be found in the first book of Enoch, 
the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament. As far as I've been able to determine the notion, at least in fledgling form, first appeared in the work of Tadian, a 2nd century Christian theologian. The, its earliest clear expression was in the early 3rd century by another Christian theologian, Tertullian. In the late 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great explored the concept more extensively than any previous writer. Most medieval theologians found his arguments persuasive. SGHA is closely related to two other ideas. That pride was the cause of Satan's fall and that angels can be ordered into different ranks from lesser to greater. <clears throat> the first book of Enoch. The oldest example of a leader of fallen angels in Judaism can be found in the book of the Watchers, part of the first book of Enoch. Composed in the 3rd century BCE, it has an elaboration of Genesis 5, 6, 1 through 4. A band of angels led by Simahaza sinned by having sex with human women. They were punished by God, who sent the angel Michael to ban, uh, bind Semihaza. When the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them, and the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget children for ourselves. And Semihaza, their chief, said to them, I fear that you will not that you will not want to do this deed, and I alone shall be guilty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath, and let us all bind one another with a curse, that none of us turn back from this counsel until we fulfill and do this deed. And to Michael, he, God, said, Go, Michael, bind Semihaza and the others with him who have mated with the daughters of men, so that they were defiled by them in their uncleanness. And when their sons perish and they see the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth until the day of their judgment and consummation, until the everlasting judgment is consummated." Then they will be led away to the fiery abyss and to the torture and to the prison where they will be confined forever. The first book of Enoch influenced early Christian writers such as Justin Martyr and Tertullian, scholar of religion Randall D. Chestnut, in the 2nd and 3rd century CE, a lively and diverse use of Enochic test, text and ideas continued unabated among many Christian writers. Foremost among these writers in the mid-2nd century was Justin Martyr, the Christian apologist and philosopher who made much of the descent of the Watchers or Deviant Angels known to us from the Book of the Watchers. Tertullian expresses attributes, his beliefs, expressly attributes his beliefs about the fallen angels and their demonic brood to Enoch and Enochic writings. The Dead Sea Scrolls. 
USB War Scroll is part of the collection of documents known as the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran. This was the site of a community of Essenes, a Jewish sect. The War Scroll was probably composed between the mid-2nd century and the mid-1st century BCE. It told of a future conflict between the Sons of Light, led by Michael, or the Prince of Light, and the Sons of Darkness, led by Belial. According to column one of the War Scroll, this battle will be evenly matched until God interve intervenes to defeat the forces of evil. From of old, you appointed the Prince of Light to assist us, and in his hand are all the angels of justice uh, and all the spirits of truth are under his dominion. You made Belial for the pit, angel of enmity, in darkness, in his domain. His counsel is to bring about wickedness and guilt. All the spirits of his lot are angels of destruction. They walk in the laws of darkness toward, towards it goes their only desire. <clears throat> In the war, the Sons of Light will be the strongest during three lots in order to strike down wickedness, and in three others, the army of Belial will gird themselves in order to force the Lot of Light to retreat. There will be infantry battalions to melt the heart but God's might will strengthen the heart of the sons of light. And in the seventh lot, God's great hand will subdue Belial and all the angels of his dominion and all the men of his lot. This is getting close to son of God... Uh, S-G-H-A, in a sense that the Satan-like Belial, the leader of the evil angels, was portrayed as being very powerful, perhaps a match for the leader of the good angels. However, unlike the Christian Satan, and also unlike Semihaza, Belial did not fall. He was made for the pit. From the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, Satan is designated as the ruler of this world. He is the God of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, scholars of religion T.J. Ray and Gregory Mobley have noted a similarity to the Essene texts. The Gospel of John tells the story of Jesus' life in terms of cosmic battle between light and darkness, good and evil. Jesus is the cosmic redeemer who comes to earth to rescue the world from darkness and cast out Satan, the ruler of this world. This cosmic war is similar to Essene scenarios about a battle between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. But yeah, it shows the idea of angels being having come to earth. Um, but yeah, they go on further here. Uh, with religious leaders and their discussions of who Satan is. And he gives sources. Now, there is the other link. 
How did the name Lucifer, meaning light bringer, originating from Roman folklore as the name of the planet Venus, become the name of the biblical devil, a.k.a. Satan? There's a lot in this question, which I'll do my best to unpack. The connection between Lucifer and the devil arises from this passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 14, 12, quoted from the King James Version. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? And this passage from Luke 10, 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So, yeah, we have Lucifer and Satan both being described as falling from heaven. More modern translations of this passage frequently translate the Latin word Lucifer as morning star or as day star, whereas the King James Version it is the proper name Lucifer. They've used the King James Version here because the translation of Lucifer as a proper name most clearly illustrates the connection that some claim between the two given prior passages. That said, many including noted theologians such as Martin Luther and John Calvin have vigorously disputed the connection between Lucifer and the devil. The proponents of the view that Lucifer and Satan are not the same draw their main argument from the context of this pack, uh, passage, Isaiah 14.4 from King James Version. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, 14.12 is still contained in what the speaker, who is probably the historic Isaiah ben Amos, is instructing. As such, theologians have claimed that Lucifer is here referring to the king of Babylon and not to the devil. The analogy with the word relating to Venus, the morning star, may have also had specific import to the audience of Isaiah's work. The rise and fall of Venus, both literally and observably in the sky and figuratively in the doings of the gods, played a role in Near Eastern religious myths, and so Isaiah may have been using religious imagery his audience would have been familiar with, but in a different context to further his own points. Another point in support of this connection being incorrect is the use of the Latin word Lucifer to mean simply light bringer. This construction is seen elsewhere in Latin, Catullus 62 8, Noctifer, meaning night bringer. And it is clear from other uses of the Latin word Lucifer in the Bible that the word does not, at the time of writing, mean only the devil. It is used elsewhere in the Bible with the meaning light bringer and is used to describe Jesus both in the Bible and in early Christian hymns. 
another difference between Lucifer and Satan is the following. Generally, Lucifer is used to refer to the archangel before his fall, while Satan is used after. In his depictions in literature, Lucifer is generally placed in the position of high esteem before his fall. A quotation from the Cursor Mundi describes his high status, saying, God set him, Lucifer, best in his God's hall as prince and sire of other L or Ali. Later, Lucifer is often associated with bright light, making the name's connection to Venus and light more sensible. However, these depictions are all much later in the Bible's writing, and so their foundations are not necessarily sound. In summary, the word Lucifer derives from the Latin for light bringer. Early Christian thinkers drew that Lucifer was the devil from the biblical passages Luke 10, 18 and Isaiah 14, 12. While this idea was not without pushback, including from prominent theologians, it was eventually generally accepted. Depictions of Lucifer in literature often feature motifs of bright, dazzling light, so his name makes sense in that context. Given the rise and fall of Venus in the sky, the Roman word for Venus being used to describe an angel who rose to God's side and then fell from heaven is not inconsistent with nearby non-Judeo-Christian religious traditions either. However, the word Lucifer is used elsewhere in the Bible to describe Jesus, and it is used with its meaning of light bringing, so its association with the devil is not without controversy. Yeah. So, essentially, there are certain passages that say yes, while others say no. All in all, the Bible itself is a collection of different books. Not all of them written by the same person. It gets confusing because of this when they're all put together to create the Christian Bible. So, yeah. Now, on to something more pleasant. Pornhub Insights. Yes, we got this from Charts. Data is beautiful. There is no nudity, no pictures. It's just data from Pornhub that they've managed to pick up. Um... Essentially, the trends that define 2023. Golden Age. Mature grew, searches grew by 77% and became the second most popular category among men, led by Mature Cougar. MILF became the second most searched term worldwide, while DILF terms, including muscle dilf, grew by 71%. Granny searches even gained 132%. And gilf by 168. Uh, 
with terms like sexy granny and hot gilf trending. Super size. Well, if I can get the thing to work properly for me. Terms big, bigger, biggest grew by 177% and searches for huge tits, huge cock, rooster, <laughs> and huge dildo by 67%. Even massive searches were up. 91% while big boobs expanded by 78% and big booty was 83% bigger. The big tits category grew 31% and BBW gained 24% to join the year's top 20. Yeah. Behind that, sex machines. Android grew 1,689%, including terms like Android Cosplay or Android Roleplay. Robot searches like Sex Robot and 3D Robot grew 304%. And machine searches like Sex Machine were up 88%. NPC, non-playable characters, searches grew 1,541%. Uniforms. Those uh, grew quite a bit. Sexual healing, therapy, massage therapy, sex therapy, foot therapy. They grew quite a bit. And they get a little further depth on each of the categories there. Oh, I need you to go back up. Most search for terms for 2023. Hentai, the biggest. Then MILF, which actually did go up by one. Lesbian, by one. Japanese actually fell by two. Pinay. Stayed even. Anal, Asian, Latina, big ass, stepmom, anime, threesome, ebony, massage, cream pie, big tits, gangbang, BBC. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. This is not British Broadcasting Corporation. <laughs> but yeah. You get some big jumps. Fimbo, Fimboy goes up 12. Trans up 10. Animation up 18. Mature plus 12. So yeah. Those terms grew quite a bit. Most popular performers. Abella Danger remained at number one. Angela White. Eva Elfie. Both grew. Lana Rhodes actually fell. Violet Myers goes up. Riley Reed fell. And Mia Khalifa, who hasn't even done porn in a long time, is still way up there, so yeah. Amateur model, so actual not Pro porn or anything. You get Candy Loves, Sweetie Fox, Porn Force, Ginny Lux. Uh, Vina. Vanellian. Daniela Anturi. So, yeah. State of the Union. In the United States, the most search terms in the U.S. At the top, lesbian. Even though there's this very high anti-LGBTQ setup in the U.S., 
the number one search term on Pornhub, lesbian. <laughs> we just want to watch them. We don't want to give them rights. The fuck. And then you got MILF, hentai, Latina, ebony, Asian, big ass, BBC, threesome, green pies, stepmom, anal, big tits, black, massage, anime, femboy, gangbang. Yeah, you got some growth in there. Gangbang grew by 12%. That's. Yeah. Poor Japanese. It used to be such a big thing. It's it's really fallen. Let's see. United States top relative searches. So each state's biggest search term <laughs> so yeah you can you can look through that but it's like <laughs> Mississippi's big on furries loves them furries <laughs> Georgia, Evan is solo, Alabama, fingering myself. <laughs> oh, God. There, there are some weird categories. South Carolina, high heels. It's like, okay, I can understand bubble butt. Bouncing boobs, I can kind of understand. Giantess. I mean, I'm sure people like it. Uh, everybody's got their own things. But my state of Virginia, what the hell are you all thinking looking up smoking as a porn search? What the actual fuck? <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> There's some goofy categories. Top 20 countries by traffic. And of course, U.S. Way at the top. Right behind us, Philippines have been growing. France stays about the same. But they're still tied with the Philippines. Mexico has been growing. They're next. U.K. actually has dropped. Japan, Germany, Italy, Canada, Brazil, Spain, Poland, Australia, Ukraine, Netherlands, Argentina, Colombia, Egypt, Chile. The experience of searching for porn in Chile, people were like, ooh, I like this stuff. <laughs> But yeah. Time spent per visit. <sighs> Only nine minutes and fifty seven seconds, but this is up by sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. Some of it you had to wonder, be like, uh, seriously? Your average visit worldwide is 10 minutes and 9 seconds. Which is an increase of 15 seconds over the previous year. 
female visitors compared to male visitors stay an extra nine seconds per visit. Difference by age, 18 to 24 is spends a much lower time. A lot of quick shot kids. <laughs> 25 to 34 they're there just a little longer about half a half a minute or so 35 to 44 they're almost right on target just under 45 to 54, they're on there about half a minute longer. 54 to 64, spend an extra minute. 65 plus, they're on there a while. They're like, whoa, la, la. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Tell me more about the story. <laughs> United States time per visit. The longest per state in the U.S. The longest visit, Maryland. 11 minutes, 31 seconds. And remember, the United States was at 9 minutes, 51 seconds which is 16 seconds longer than the previous year. <sighs> but, on the positive side, the top 10 are all there longer than average US, so it's like, okay. Then at the bottom here, we got the quick shot states. Louisiana, what's going on, y'all? What's going on? <laughs> oh, goodness. Favorite times to watch porn. Looks like right around that 11 p.m. midnight hour. Like, mm mm, they love their pawn in. Most viewed categories 2023 at the top lesbian. Behind is Japanese, then Ebony. Look. I like all races when it comes to women there's all some there's something nice about all of them <sighs> yeah they're like uh, they're all good You want to look at Ebony's as chocolate and white people as vanilla. Then you've got other flavors too, like butterscotch for Asian and um, <laughs> I've said I would have thought about some of these a little. So yeah, uh, But yeah, for me, it don't matter really the race. You know, if a woman's attractive, she's attractive. 
That's just kind of how it is for me. <sighs> Though I'm a bit of a horny old goat. Meh. <laughs> the world's most viewed categories. They've got them by continent and country. <laughs> Russians prefer to watch Russian. <laughs> Ebony's pretty big in the U.S. and mid to southern Africa. So yeah. can't quite tell what the color but I think it's also Japanese like Japanese <laughs> yeah North America ebony and lesbian Australia lesbian <laughs> South America you've got lots of anal some lesbian some ebony so yeah I mean there you go. God, I get the feeling YouTube's going to censor the crap out of this video, even though there's, I'm just talking about stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'll let y'all watch, look, peruse the rest of this chart at your own leisure, because, of course, I always have them down at the bottom in the links box, but, yeah. Where do Christmas trees grow? Another chart. And it looks like the biggest are, uh, amount are gotten from southern, or let's see, western North Carolina. Because you're looking at Jackson County, Ash County, and the other biggest amount is over here in the western northwest parts of the U.S. along the west coast for uh, Washington and Oregon. But yeah, the biggest ones are Ash County, North Carolina with 2 million and Clackamas County, Oregon with 2 million. But yeah. I just I found that interesting. That along the eastern U.S., you'll there's a lot of Christmas trees found. So yeah. Now into some more stories. <coughs> Kentucky family doesn't notice a baby owl nesting in their Christmas tree for four days. This is in Lexington. Kentucky family was in for acute surprise after they discovered that a baby owl had been living in their Christmas tree for four days before being found. Uh, they talk about picking out a tree, but this year they got a gift that Santa doesn't usually deliver. I was shocked. I was stunned. Hidden just out of sight on their Christmas tree was a baby owl. Due to the look of the bird, it was able to hide out in the for four days before being discovered. How could this have happened? The family still isn't sure. They have three dogs. We use this room nonstop. We watch TV here. The kitchen's right over there. And there was no indication. So... Yeah, even for four days, they didn't realize it was still there in the tree. Oh, <laughs> Baby owl. From Salon, Paul Ryan goes off on podcast. Trump's not a conservative. He's an authoritarian narcissist. Thank you. Someone else verifies this. 
Trump's tendencies are guided by narcissism and whatever makes him popular, the ex-Speaker of the House says. Former Republican House Speaker Paul Ryan, during a podcast appearance, denounced Donald Trump as an authoritarian narcissist while praising former reps Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, Kinzinger for opposing the former president despite the cost to their congressional careers. The Fox Court board members' comments came during a November interview with Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Teneo Political Risk Advisory, that has gained traction this week, according to The Guardian. So, yeah. Paul Ryan calling him an authoritarian narcissist. Which, I mean, it's true. He's egotistical, and it's all about him. I mean, seriously. From CNBC, White House puts corporate price gouging front and center. We see American families hurting. It's about damn time you push back on price gouging. We, I've been pointing this out for the longest time, and I try to mention it here, and people are like, shut up, it's just inflation. It's, it's supply chains. You know, it, it's, it's this... Uh, you don't realize a big portion of this is price gouging. Uh, the White House doubled down on Biden's demand this week that corporations stop the price gouging. Prices for producers have grown a lot more slowly over the last year. Companies should pass those savings on to consumers. The economic data shows falling inflation rates and steady job growth, but consumers do not feel the increased buying power that typically accompanies a strong economy. Yeah, I've been pointing this out for the longest time now, but <laughs> who the but listens to me, you know, even though the, I know what the hell I'm talking about. And yeah, here's some photos taken of the Geminid meteor shower. You can see the meteors streak across the sky here. They get a close up look. But yeah, I think it's just neat to be able to see things like that. From Sky News, Israeli ambassador to the UK says there is absolutely no chance of a two-state solution after the October 7th Hamas attack. says the world must realize the Oslo paradigm has failed and there's no chance for a two-state solution. I agree there's no chance for a two-state solution. You're going to have to back the fuck down and w live together as peaceful people. And that's what the fuck's going to have to fucking happen. Because the things you've been doing have not been fucking working. The government of Israel is as much at fault as Hamas is. They are both guilty parties. Period. It's clear as a fucking bell. And if you're not willing to acknowledge and look at it, then fuck you. Oh, so, yeah. Now, well, let's get into some videos here.
Chicago City Council holds a meeting to vote on resolution in solidarity with Israel and one of the residents have one of the most eloquent gave one of the most eloquent summary of genocide heard yet. Pause. Back up. Unmute. Next speaker is Gabriel Miller. I would, I, I would like to add my voice to the chorus here today in opposition to this ridiculous resolution. At a time when the rest of the world is condemning Israel for committing war crime after war crime, Chicago is fiddling around on whether to condemn Hamas. By doing so, Chicago will be doing its part in enabling the genocide of Palestinians. And this resolution acts like it's on the side of innocent civilians. So in that case, I'd like to ask, are you considering a resolution condemning Israel for what, using white phosphorus against the civilian population? Are you considering condemning Israel for its planned war crime of forced removal of one million Palestinians from northern Gaza? Are you going to condemn them for cutting off food, water, and electricity to Gaza? Another war crime called collective punishment. Did it ever cross your mind to condemn Israel when they assassinated Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh in broad daylight, or when they brutalized the people carrying her coffin peacefully, or when Israeli snipers killed innocent peaceful protesters throughout the March of Return? Did the people in office before you ever consider condemning Israel at any point since its inception would it cram a country full of people into a 60 mile corner of their own country, creating the largest concentration camp in history, the largest open air prison in the world? The answer is a resounding no. You never considered it, nor did your ancestors. But unfortunately for you, times have changed. The world is increasingly aware of the crimes of Israel and increasingly aware of the framework of politicians who enable their continued apartheid by resolutions such as these. And in a city like Chicago, with majority black and brown people who have experienced the apartheid-like conditions of oppression in the United States, a generation of young people have emerged who understand immediately that we have everything in common with the Palestinian people and nothing in common with the brutal Zionists under who they suffer. A generation of people who are not surprised when we find out that our politicians, up to our president, spread lies about 40 babies being beheaded in order to rationalize genocide. We're only surprised that they're forced to walk those lies back. But of course, the damage is done. People are still spewing the debunked lies about rape and massacre of babies, even here in this very meeting, when actually there is endless evidence of Israel having killed over 500 babies in the last 48 hours alone, having dropped more bombs in 24 hours than the U.S. dropped on Afghanistan in one year. And finally, let it be known that condemning the attack as the actions of some fringe group misses the point of what's going on. The attacks were carried out by a broad coalition of groups from every section of Palestinian society, not just Hamas. That coalition represents a people determined to attain freedom at any cost, and they have arrived at this point in the face of a broad coalition of right-wing Zionists and their supporters like those in the city council who would start a meeting with a prayer calling for their attempt at freedom, a second holocaust for are so silent you could hear a rat piss on cotton when innocent, peaceful Palestinians are annihilated day in and day out like the Native Americans of this country. If it were another time, these same people would be condemning Africans for rebelling against their slave masters during slavery, such as Nat Turner or in the Haitian Revolution. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, please. Yeah, the government ass-kissing of Israel who's committing genocide. Enough. The American people don't agree with it. You look at polls, the majority of Americans are like, enough, ceasefire, fit. this needs to end now. And Israel's showing its ass as a fucking aggressor. I mean... If you still support them, why? Why? What in the fuck makes you think it's still right to support an oppressive regime? They have went from experiencing the Holocaust to committing one of their own.
And again, let's get this right. I am referring to the government of Israel and the IDF. Not the citizens, although there is some brainwashing that's went on there that, that a lot of them have the wrong ideations. But yeah, what you should be praying for is, you know, peace in Palestine, peace in Gaza, because, you know, the monsters in Israel, you can more or less call them Nazis. Pause, back you up, turn the volume on. Now, not going to stop posting. This is the call to action. This happened in Florida, and people, we need to wake up, stand up, and we need to cry loud. There are too many unalivings, lynchings that are happening people being found hung and down in jacksonville actually in baldwin florida they're trying to rule everything that happens to this right here people like this right here trying to rule it a unaliving of themselves this is keandre taylor he was working down in baldwin florida at a travel center travel centers of america petro down in baldwin florida he voiced his uh, concerns many times to his family even tried to reach out to HR regarding the harassment and the racism that he was facing at his job, but nobody was listening at his job. His family was, but at his job, they wasn't. They failed him. Some of the last words that his family heard from him when he, when he wrote them was, I don't want to be unalived out here, man. In less than 48 hours, before his unaliving, Keandre expressed his fear of dying at the hands of racist staff and co-workers. September the 30th this year, Keandre was hung. He was hung. And at the time of his unaliving, his emergency contact was not notified. His family was not notified. He had been unalive for almost 24 hours before his mother, Tawana Richmond Taylor, was even notified. And there are many inconsistencies and untruths that clearly shows that this was not done to himself. Somebody did it to him or somebody, a lot of, uh, it was extra people. This was done to him. He didn't do it to himself. He had bruises. He had knots on his head. He had a swollen eye. And, and, and he was like somebody had actually beat this boy up. He's 31 years old. He has three children that are under 10 years old, and they are the light of his life. And this young man was found hung in a storage shed at his job at the Travel Centers of America in Baldwin, Florida, in his uniform. And the only way that his family found out was it was somebody that he was cool with that called the family, called the mother. Now, this may be a procedure, but everybody at his job could identify him. But the police came in and still wanted to fingerprint him. Hmm. The questions that have to be asked. If he committed an unaliving to himself, how did he hit himself in the eye? How did he hit himself in the head? How did he end up with all these bruises? How? This is just like the Yona Lubrin case and many other cases that are happening all in Florida. This stuff is happening in Florida we need to wake up, people. And when you try to search this story, people, TikTok, when you try to search this story, there are no news stories, no articles or anything. It's the family crying aloud. So we need to get this out there. We need to share this, share it far and wide. We need to bring attention to this. Justice for Keandre Taylor.
Yeah. I mean, there should be nowhere in America that lynchings are happening. You would think we're beyond that point in America. But apparently we haven't reached post-racial America. Nah, there's apparently still people who think we live in the fucking 1960s. Fucking racist dicks. Honestly. There is no excuse for that at all. It should not happen. But there are fuckheads out there who still enjoy being dickheads. It's... Oh. Yeah, wanted to share. I agree quite a bit with this particular video. Dr. Osama Abu Irshad. Mr. President, unfortunately you have failed the test. You have failed the test. You have lied about your claim and your promise when you came to office that you're coming to restore America's moral authority. There is no morality in standing with genocide. There is no morality in apologizing for genocide. There is no morality in enabling genocide. Mr. President, your attempts to rewrite history are not going to work and is not going to work. Your lies about wisdom and your own wisdom are not, is not going to fly. You are not a wise person. I agree completely. Biden's pushed me to the point I will not vote for him in 2024. I voted for him in 2020 to get demon head out. But Biden's fucked himself in the ass. He can go fuck off. I sure as fuck won't vote for Trump either. Both of them are shit bags. Can we have a fucking decent ass candidate? Someone who isn't a fucking piece of shit. I mean, seriously. It gets absolutely fucking stupid to have shitbag one and shitbag two. This is 2016 all over again. Shitbag one and shitbag two. Now, that being said, I'm still going to go vote so I can oppose the fucking Republican fuckheads and make sure there's something keeping dumb fucker goddamn some bitch Trump from being able to really do as much damage as he fucking can because that dipshit fucking ruined this goddamn country by putting three justices on the Supreme Court.
But yeah, I sure as fuck am not voting for Biden or Trump. Fuck them both. We're back to the fucking shit in the plate, shit in the cup. Which one do you fucking want? I mean, that's where we are as a country. Both of them are shit candidates. They sucked horribly as presidents. Fuck! Both! But, anyway. Now that I've got that off my mind, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here. As always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tells you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll be putting links in the description box below the video. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.